Father in heaven, Father who is here with us and who dwells in us, we acknowledge your presence. Father, it would be improper of me not to tell you thanks for the blessings that we have received at the camp meeting already. Amen. We appreciate it, Father. Sometimes we are neglectful to say this, but indeed we are happy. We are thankful. And along with our thanksgiving, there is an appeal, Father, that I will express on behalf of all of us. An appeal that you will maintain us in this state of commitment to our God, of surrender, of seeking our happiness in you alone. We thank you because we know you not only here, but you answer our prayers. Because we come to you in that precious name above all names. The name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. I'm a little negligent uh, because I haven't welcomed our sister sitting in the corner here. Brother Morris, can you remind us of your name? Sister Nadine. A pleasure to have you. Half of your life gone too. <laughs> but we're going to try to catch up. <laughs> All right. This morning, my, my sermon is not my sermon. This morning, I'm going to acknowledge that this sermon, I, I, I am pirating from a brother in Romania. Um, actually, I guess, I guess I'm somewhat responsible because we did a study, something like this, and then, and then my, this brother in Romania kind of put it together a little differently, and I like what he did. In fact, I not only like it, but it has stirred me a little bit, and I want to try to rep replicate some of what he shared, maybe with a few additional thoughts of my own. But it's something that I believe is really significant and important and very relevant so I want to share it. And um, the title of the message is The Mystery of Iniquity. Now I'm going to ask you to go with me to a passage in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. You all know this passage very well, but we're going to read a few verses from here. Second Thessalonians 2, and I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 7. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now that last phrase is a little challenging. Many times people wonder, what does this mean? He who now letteth, will let. The word let there, is a, the way it is used is an old English expression. It can mean allow or hinder. It can mean opposite. It can mean the one who is now allowing this thing will continue, to, will continue to allow it until he's taken out of the way. Or it can mean the one who is hindering this thing will continue to hinder it until he's taken out of the way. I'm going to comment on that a little bit more later on. But the first thing I want you to notice is that According to the Apostle Paul, the greatest danger to the Christian church would come from where? Within the church. I want you to notice that. The danger was not from paganism. The danger was not from, from, from Hindus or Mithraism. I mean, persecution and killing of Christians was not even the greatest danger. The greatest danger was something that would arise within the Christian church. Now, for, for something to arise in the Christian church that becomes so dangerous, you know that it has to be extremely subtle and deceptive. I mean, anything open, any openly false doctrine would be re re repulsed immediately. So it has to be very subtle of such a nature that it has the power to deceive people's minds. 
In, in fact, this brother, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, it, it, it's brother Vlad from Romania. He, uh, he actually described it as a Trojan horse. And I think that that description is an apt description because, you know, the Trojan horse was this horse that they sneaked into the city and everybody thought it was perfectly innocent, but it was filled with soldiers inside who came out at night and conquered the city. Now, there are, there are a few things to notice about this mysterious working of iniquity. First thing is that from the time of the Apostle Paul, it already existed. Because Paul says what? The mystery of iniquity what? It does already work. So, so cast your minds about and think about the Christian church, the early Christian church, the apostolic church, the fiery church, the spirit-filled church. And ask yourself, what could there be in the Christian church that early that could be referred to as the mystery of iniquity? Paul saw something, didn't he? And of course, as we say, it was disguised. Otherwise, it would not have been so dangerous. Third thing we can guarantee is that it was a religious doctrine, right? Had to be religion. So there's some religious doctrine in the early Christian church so subtle that it is not clearly recognized and yet it is satanic. Next, it was the opposite of Christ. Has to be. Because if Jesus is a central doctrine and if Jesus is the goal of everything, any doctrine that is so dangerous has to be opposed to Christ. And of course, you can, you can imply that it must have been something that was promoted by maybe outstanding people in the church. Would you agree with that? Because that's what gives it more power to deceive. Now, what would you say as a Christian? As a Christian, I'm going to ask for an answer from anybody. What would you say is the greatest evil that could happen to a Christian? Being deceived, unbelief. Aaron says to turn away from Christ. I'm going to say to be separated from Christ. All right. All of these are subheadings of that one great thing, right? To be separated from Christ. Death is not as bad as that. Torture is not as bad as that. That's what killed Jesus, wasn't it? To be separated from from God, to be separated from Christ is the worst thing that can possibly happen to a Christian. So, I suggest to you right at the beginning that the, 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 this, this dangerous thing, this mystery of iniquity that Paul feared so much, the ultimate fruitage of it would have been separation from Christ. Now, I'm going to come a little closer to the mark and get closer to exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to use Paul's own words because Paul is a person who who is most forthright? Well, Paul and John in talking about this mysterious thing, right? Now look at what Paul says. Go to Galatians. Galatians 5. I'm going to ask somebody to read for me verse 4. Galatians 5, 4. Thank you, Abby. It says, Christ is become of what? What does that mean? As far as you are concerned, Jesus might just as well never have come, never have died, never been resurrected. He means nothing to you if what? If you are justified by the law. Paul says something can happen to destroy your Christian relationship completely and it is Dependent on your relationship to the law. Now this is Bible. This is scripture. This is the word of God. I personally believe. Somebody said it yesterday. But I believe and I endorse that. That the greatest apostle was Paul. None of the other apostles dared to say what Paul said. Paul never walked with Jesus when he was in the flesh. But Paul says look here. I was taught personally by Christ. And he says look here. Even if an angel from heaven. Read it. He says, even an angel from heaven, if he comes and teaches anything different from what Paul teaches, what? Let him be cursed. Man, what kind of authority is that? Paul, to me, 
was the greatest of the apostles. And I think this is why God allowed him to write more than half of the New Testament. Peter has two books. John has about four. Paul has about 14 or 15 out of that little thing. So, he's the most prolific writer in the New Testament. And I believe God ordained it this way because he understood God's message best of all. You'll find that even in... The man that is most hated of all Christian writers by the Muslims is Paul. Rastas hate him the most. And many Christians hate him the most. And I'm going to... You won't be surprised to find that in the early Christian church, he was also the most hated. Pretty amazing. But Paul says... Depending on your relationship to the law, Christ may become of no effect to you. Might as well Christ never come. Depending on your relationship to the law. Did you understand that a relationship to the law can be so destructive? That Jesus becomes nothing to you just because of how you relate to the law? We realize now. Um, See, he says in Galatians 2 again. Galatians 2 and verse 21. And I think Brother Lenny read this a few nights ago. Or he says it again a different way. He says, I'm not going to frustrate God's grace. And you know what frustrate means, right? Mm-hmm. Some time ago we, we emphasize it. I'm trying to give, give, give Brother Keith something. And he pushes his hand in his pocket to pay me. He said, Brother Keith, it's a gift. And he says, come on, come on, man. Uh, how much do you want? I said, it's a gift. And he's taking out money to give me. What is he doing? He's frustrating. Frustrating me and frustrating my grace. I want to give him something and he's insisting on paying for it. I'm, he's frustrating me. Paul says, I'm not going to frustrate God's gift. When God gives you something, what do you do? Open your hand and take it. Don't try to justify your acceptance by trying to give God something. Whether it's your law keeping or whatever. Don't try to do this. Paul says, if you try to do this, you are frustrating God's gr- gift. And what the result is that for you... Christ has died in vain. What? The entire plan of salvation, the Son of God promised for for over these 6,000 years means nothing to you if this is how you, you go about it. If you try to add to what God has done through your attitude, your, your, your attitude to the law. Now you know that the Bible talks about two mysteries. It talks about the mystery of God And it talks about here now we just read the mystery of iniquity. And it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to to figure out that they, they, they probably are two opposing things. If you can discover what one is, you probably can know what the other one is. Right, Sister Charlene? They are two opposites. Now, can anybody tell me, and of course you can, so please tell me, what is the mystery of God? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Where do you find that verse? All right, brother. Brother um, Cottrell says, First Timothy three sixteen. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But I'm thinking of another one. Huh? I haven't heard it yet. The one I'm looking for, the one that you quoted. Brother Howard is saying it, right? Look at Colossians one verse twenty seven. This mystery, Paul says, Colossians 1 and verse 27, is Christ in you. That is the mystery of God. The great mystery is how you are human being sit down here this morning and God is dwelling in your body. That is the mystery of God. That is the mystery that many people deny. Many people re- reject it outrightly. They say it's only figurative. But Paul says this is God's mystery. And this, as, you, as, as we have said, is the great secret of the Christian life that was hidden from, from ages and that God has revealed in, 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 since the, the, gospel, the gospel time. That Christ, your body is to be the temple of the living God. It's a marvelous mystery. Now, I'll tell you why this mystery of God is so wonderful. I'm going to ask somebody to find First John 3. And verse 9 and read. Don't read it if you don't have a strong voice. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his sin remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, 
That is one verse of scripture that I know many people have avoided. And why have they avoided it? Because it's too strong. It's too strong and because I've never met a Christian who says, this verse, I've experienced it fully. I've never met a Christian who said that. Because it's too strong. Right, Jenny? It says, he that is born of God, what? Cannot sin. Look here. You go into any Christian congregation and say this, and everybody will, will modify what you said. Everybody will kind of correct you and say, yes, but you can sin. And you do sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But John doesn't say that. John says that the person who is born of God does not commit sin. And it's very strong. And if this is true, you can understand why Paul says, this is the mystery of God, Christ in you. Because what John says is that you, his seed remains in you. And who is the seed of God? Christ. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son, the seed of God, right? If he remains in you, Christ is not the minister of sin. We sin because we lose touch with him. Isn't that right? As long as he lives, you will not sin. That's what the scripture says and that's what I believe. And this is the mystery of godliness. And until we get it right, we will keep on talking about overcoming sin. And we'll keep on studying and encouraging each other and berating each other. But we won't overcome sin until this reality becomes ours. Christ in you. So then, since you all agree that the mystery of iniquity is probably the opposite of the mystery of God, what would you say is the mystery of iniquity by default? It has to be that Christ does not live in you. But if Christ does not live in you and you intend to live righteously, how are you going to live? You have got to find some way to try to create righteousness. And that way of creating righteousness obviously, is popularly God's way instead of God. And almost the entire Christian world is chasing God's way. But God's way is not God. What we need is not the way. We need the person. When people thought that the law was the way to God, what did Jesus say? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You are chasing the word. You search the scriptures, God's way, because you think that in them you have eternal life, but you will not do what? Come to me. Me. I am the answer. The answer is not the way. The answer is the person. Well, unless you take the way to be Jesus. But if you take the way to be the word or the instructions or the law, you are barking up the wrong tree. So, you agree with me then, we are together so far, that the mystery of iniquity to be logical has to be the opposite of the mystery of God. The mystery of God is Christ in you. The mystery of iniquity has to be the teaching that Christ himself does not actually live in us. And we're not far off here at all. Go to 1 John chapter 4 and let's read what it says there. Yes, David. I can, I can appreciate the mystery of Christ living in us. Yes. Right. But seeing that the natural state of man is outside of Christ. What is a mystery? Right? Remember that we're talking about something in the Christian church. Oh. Man outside of Christ is lost already. No mystery. No mystery. Right. The mystery is when in the Christian church you have a teaching that puts him outside of you. That's the mystery. That's the mystery of iniquity that, that results in Satan's representatives sitting in the temple of God. Because this is the principle of Satan. Because you know that all false religion teaches improvement by obeying rules. Every false religion on the planet. Only Christianity teaches improvement by somebody living in you. Only Christianity. Everybody else has to relate to rules. And the rules are different. Buddhist, Buddhism has their rules. Hinduism has their rules. Islam has their rules. Rasta have their rules. Only Christianity gives you a person. And false Christianity gives you the rules. But true Christianity gives you the person as God's answer. That's what makes Christianity different from everybody else. Christianity gives us a savior. The rest of them gives us a morality. 
Morality never died for us. It was a person. Morality doesn't live for us. It is a person. So we go to 1 John chapter 4. And here's what it says in verses 2 and 3. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come where? In the flesh. In whose flesh? In my flesh and your flesh. Is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. So when Paul says the mystery of iniquity does already work. John backs him up, right? Because John said the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And in fact, in, in, in chapter 2, he shows you that these antichrists were among us, but they went out from us, right? When he says they went out, you don't believe they left the church. They left the faith, but they didn't leave the church. They were very much in the church, the, the spirit of antichrist, and they were there teaching that Jesus Christ does not live inside of you. And why would they teach something like this? Make a guess. I'm coming, Janik. Make a guess. Why would they teach something like this, that Jesus Christ does not live in the person? You have to find a way to preserve a relationship with instructions. If my body is a temple of the living God, I can say like Paul, it is not I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. If you are going to deny me that, you have to find a way to make me do the right thing, right? You have to impose rules on me. And if people are, I find that the people who are most Resistant to the idea of Christ living his life through us are the people who are most wedded to the law. Yes, Jenny. I was saying that some people, when they read this verse, they might say that it means, when you say Christ come in the flesh, it means that Christ came to earth as a man. I understand, and that's what, that's what most people believe, and that's what I believe for a long time. But if you think about it, how many Christians were there who denied that Jesus was a man? Even in the early church, in any age. Everybody knows that he came in flesh and blood. No, I've never heard anybody deny that. So the idea that this was the, the main teaching of Antichrist is a little ridiculous. Nobody ever denies that. What they deny is that Jesus actually lives in us. And if you, if you notice what it says, he denies that Jesus Christ is present tense. I know what they might say. It was present tense when the person was writing it. No, but when John was writing it, Jesus had been gone for 40 odd years, 50 odd years. So it, it, the only way it could be is in the flesh at the time was if he was living in us as, as the Holy Spirit. Right. And, and you have to put all the different bits and pieces together. When you look at what the issue was in the church, right. based on what Paul says, mm -hmm. you see a rejection of the, you, you see that Christ in you is a key doctrine. You see that the mystery of iniquity has to be the opposite. Everything put together makes it clear what he's saying. All right, the key conflict in the early church. I just want to point out that what the key issue was. Now, you look at the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And what do you see? You see a spirit-filled church. And what do you think? That was the most perfect church that ever existed on the earth. In fact, when you talk about what God's church should be like, you think of the apostolic church. And, and what has happened is that I come to realize that sometimes we don't see the picture clearly enough. I want you to look at, um, let's go to Acts chapter 15. And just read a couple of verses. I'm going to read and you could just follow with me. Now it says in verses 1 and 2. It says, And certain, are we ready? And certain men which came down from where? Judea. Judea thought the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses. What? You cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. Give me another word for dissension and disputation. It looked like it's so it close to quarrel to me. <laughs> Plenty noise and argument and debating going on. It says there was no small dissension and disputation. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now where did these men come from? Judea, Judea right? And Judea, what, was, what would you say Judea was in relation to the church? Headquarters. 
Now if these men came from Judea, what do you think was the teaching in Judea? They never came down there independently. They came and presented the popular concept that, was, that existed in Jerusalem. Now this amazes and appalls me. You mean to say that the headquarters of the church, where Jesus started, where the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, you mean to say that in that place, the vast majority of believers, if not everyone, believe that you had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved? Notice, we are not talking about something optional or something helpful. Let's say, except you do this, you cannot be saved. Now that is striking. Because this was years after Pentecost. Many years. And they still hold to this idea. Now, now notice something else. Certain things are being discussed. And there are some brethren who are saying the law, the law. But what does this brother do? Paul said, look here. I'm not bowing on this matter. You brethren are wrong. And they have a big argument, right? Paul is contending against the headquarters of the church, you know. Him and Barnabas stand up and they are arguing with the leaders who come from the headquarters of the church. And they have big argument. And what happens to the people at Antioch? They're confused. Paul brings them. Paul is one of the, the, the persons who has been there as their main teacher for many years. But these men, because of their authority and their influence, confuse the people. You know what they have to do? They decide to send Paul and Barnabas and some others to go to Jerusalem to go find out the truth. Paul's word is no longer good enough for them. That is what is happening and it, it frightens me. It frightens me because you think this church so filled with the Holy Spirit, every step God is just directing their minds. No, they are like us. They are having the same debates and arguments. And they are still having the same confusing issues. And they still have to be sorting out and thinking out things. And the bad influence is still there. The mystery of iniquity. The argument carried weight with the Antioch believers. Now let's go a little further down in the same chapter. Let's go to verse 5. It says Paul goes up there now and, and, and Barnabas. And what happened? It says... But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, given the names of some people who are at this conference, you know, Paul and Barnabas, given the name of some others. Peter, James, John is there, right? And I assume all the apostles are there. And what are they having? Big argument. You mean to say these great luminaries, these lights, don't know the truth? My goodness, Paul, uh, Peter can't talk up, James can't talk up, John can't talk up and settle the argument. No, it's big argument. And who is pushing this thing? Converted Pharisees, right? You know that when Jesus was here, the greatest enemies he had were the Pharisees. Over the same issue of the law, they were his greatest enemies. Now Jesus has gone and come back. And all of a sudden the church is filled with these Pharisees. And what are they doing? They're pushing the same thing that they used to push. And their influence has been so overwhelming, they have carried the church with them. And only these two little men from Bakawal, who come from I don't know where, are there standing up and opposing this thing. Now, it looks like just a little dispute. But do you, do you realize, brethren, that both sides are saying, if you don't do what they say, you can't see it. Right? The Pharisees say, if you don't do this, you can't save. Paul, Paul said, if you do this, you can't save. Right? Paul said, if you are justified by the law, Christ is nothing to you. Paul is focusing on Christ. They are saying, if you don't do the law, you can't be saved. They are focusing on the law. They have come into Christianity apparently, but they have not left their baggage behind. Now you notice, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, wasn't he? What did Paul say happened when he became a Christian? He said, I was a Pharisee. I was, I was circumcised the eighth day according to the law. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. What things were gained to me, I counted but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. And I do count them but dung and count them as nothing that I may win Christ. Amen. Every Pharisee should have done that. Amen. But Paul apparently was one of the only few Pharisees, if not the only one, who left the baggage behind. The rest of them carried it with them. 
Now, the, the reason why I am so distraught about this is because this same disease is infecting present-day Adventism. There are, it's not just, it's not just the, 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 the love affair that people have with the, the moral law, because we all believe the moral law is good. We all believe that the problem is that men try to approach God through their doing and their behavior and believe that reference to a set of rules is the way we ought to live. Because they don't accept that you can be changed by the indwelling, the miraculous indwelling of another person, Jesus Christ. Jesus never went about thinking about the law when he was doing good, did he? The law was inside of him. He did good naturally because it was his nature. And so is everyone that is born of God. But the overall attitude to the law has infected Adventism. Not just Adventism. Christendom in general. Some people are not talking about the Ten Commandments. They say the Ten Commandments are done away with. But you know what they do? They make other laws and put them on the people just as heavy or heavier. Some churches that say the law is done away with. Look here. You, you have to dress full white to go to church. Right? You have to wear a hat. You have to do this. You have to do that. They, they put a set of rules upon you heavier than the law. It's a principle of legalism that is so destructive. So, we go on to verses 7 to 11. It says, And when there had been much disputing, that's a Bible conference, man, plenty talking. Remember. All right, I'm going to allow you to read verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. The same what is there to consider? James and those who walk with Jesus. Yes. Can confuse no one to consider the matter. Exactly. I, but I bet you Paul wasn't confused. <laughs> and we're going to see it, right? And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up. So there's plenty of argument they have on the, before they can finally settle this. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of God. So he has authority now because he's the first man God chose to go to the Gentiles, right? Hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now this is the final, ultimate proof. The proof is the Holy Spirit. He says, look here, brethren. God never asked if they were keeping the law when he gave them the Holy Spirit. He just gave them the Holy Spirit like that because they believe. And that's his reason for saying, now therefore, why tempt ye God? Why are you testing God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What is he talking about? circumcision and the law of Moses neither we nor our fathers were able to bear this why are you tempting God to put a yoke on the neck of these brethren that's what Paul calls it and there are some people I've spoken to who says he wasn't talking about the laws that God gave he was talking about the laws that the Pharisees added which is utterly ridiculous right it shows how far people will go in twisting what the Bible says to suit their agenda it says, neither we nor our fathers were able to bear it. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And you know the decision they took, right? They took a decision that we're not going to ask these Gentiles to do anything other than they gave them four things. And my friend says, look here, even to give them those four things, they were wrong because they put more rules on them. He said they should just have told them, go and stay with Christ. But they were so used to the law way, they had to make four laws and give the Gentiles... And they said, we're not going to come, we, we, we will command them to do these four things. So they still had the law mentality. Well, that's an interesting take on it, and maybe he's right. Now, when he says this yoke that is put up on the neck of the disciples, see how Paul, Paul later on in the book of Galatians, Galatians was written after this, and, and Paul is remembering what happened. You know what Paul says? This only would I want to learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by what? By the works of the law or by the hearing of it. He uses the same proof that Peter uses, right? Bring the same argument. You can know what God wants of you because look, when you receive the Holy Spirit, on what basis did you receive it? And he says, are you so stupid? You have begun by faith and now what? 
Are you now to be made perfect by works? So you don't receive the Holy Spirit and then progress to law. You begin with faith. You continue with faith. You don't progress to law after you find faith. Now what was this yoke that was upon the neck? Let us certify what is really being spoken about. Galatians 5. Verses 1 and 2. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. Our freedom. Stand fast, therefore, in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with what? Yoke. Same yoke Peter spoke about, wasn't it? Yes. A yoke that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, he's, he's telling you what he's talking about. I say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. It is that bad. What he's saying is that when you begin to turn to the law, to seek God's way in the law, what it means is that you have not accepted what Jesus did. It's a denial of Christ. It's a rejection of Christ. It's that bad. And when a man rejects Christ, how is he to be saved? What? The law is going to save you? The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Hebrews 7 and verse 19. Now, at the end of that conference in Jerusalem, let's go back to Acts 15 for just a moment. It says in verses 19 to 21. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, see the four rules, and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Who went to synagogue every Sabbath day? Jews. So what he's saying is that what, what they did at this council of Jerusalem was make a difference between who? Gentiles and Jews. They segregated the church. They made two different standards for the church in this council at Jerusalem. They said, Jews, let's not worry about them because they can go to synagogue every day and do what? Learn the law of Moses. But for the Gentiles, we are making a rule and they don't need to do these things. They just need to observe these four things. But, but, but um, remember they... they the, the issue was, what are the Gentiles to do? Because they came down to the Gentiles at Antioch and told them, except you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. So the issue was the Gentiles that they were discussing, right? Now what many people don't realize, and I know we all here are aware of it, is that the Jews apparently were concerned that Jews were being influenced to turn away from the law. They wanted to maintain their identity as Jews and still be Christians. And I'm going to show you how Paul addressed this. Just look quickly at Galatians chapter 3. And maybe, maybe that is something that we all have to guard against. Because sometimes, you know, I want to be Jamaican and I want to be Christian at the same time. And um, sometimes that doesn't work. And look what he says from verse 26. He says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see the Apostle Paul is saying, look here, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. You can't treat people two different ways. You can't have two different standards. It's one set of people God has. And what makes the difference? You are all in Christ Jesus. And being in Christ Jesus, there is one thing that you all live by, and it is by the life of Christ. Now the Jews in Jerusalem, that church in Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and the rest of them made a big mistake. I put it before you. 
They were apostles of God. They were chosen to do a work and they did it. But their theology was wrong on this matter. It was wrong on this matter. It's a mistake to be, believe that because you are, be, you are called by God, your theology is always perfect. Don't believe that foolishness. Don't believe that foolishness. That has led a, a, a great many people into a great deal of confusion because they believe that once God has spoken by you, everything you say is immaculate and they take you as the rosette as the Rosetta Stone, as the Oracle. You can't run. And so you have followed people who don't know what they were doing straight down into disaster. Brother King. So, I've broken my rule, but go ahead. Could you say that Paul heard as well about not, um, you know, emphasizing... Sure, it could be said. And that is why I, I said at the beginning that I believe Paul was the greatest advocate of the gospel. That's why I emphasize the point where Paul says, if even an angel from heaven teaches something different, let him be accursed. Either he was a beer-faced liar, mm -hmm. arrogant beer-faced liar, or you have to accept it, right? Because that's his, that's his, his statement. And then I, that's why I show that he has written most of the New Testament. I think there's a design behind that. That's what I was trying to say. Now go to Galatians chapter 2 again. Galatians 2. And I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 5. He says, then, after four, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. That's the time when he and Barnabas went up to this council. And took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to them which were of reputation... Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. He says, I want to find out if they think I was wrong in what I was saying. But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now look what he says next. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Who is he talking about? Those Pharisees and the others. He says there are false brethren crept in unawares to spy out our liberty. That's how Paul describes them. How did James and Peter describe them? Our Jewish brethren that believe Paul says there are false brethren crept in unawares to spy out our freedom. Two different perspectives, right? One set of them embracing these people with their folly. Paul says, not so. These are wolves in sheep clothing. They're coming here to come spy out our freedom in Christ and bring us into bondage. They are false brethren. They're not real Christians. Two different perspectives. It's pretty amazing. And I'm saying, you have to read it and decide which side you're going to fall on. He <laughs> says, next. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. What is he saying? Look here, I never gave them one little bit of room to wiggle. Right. So he's talking about the contention they had at Jerusalem, right? The big argument that they had, Paul says, I never let upon them, I never gave them any room to get away from the truth. That's how Paul looked at the issue. And that's pretty amazing. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. That was the reason why he did it. Now, I have something interesting to throw into the mix. Now, all the time you hear about three disciples and then three apostles. Peter, James, and John. Now the person that you read about in Acts chapter 15 who was at the head of that Jerusalem council. In fact, years ago I read, I was doing some studies you know, as an Adventist and they mentioned how James was the first general conference president. And of course at that time I kind of poo-pooed it a little. But when I look more closely at the book of Acts and what goes on, it almost seems like he, he was up there at the head. Yeah. Almost seems so. And yet in Acts chapter 12, it tells you that very early in the history of the church, Herod beheaded James. So it's kind of strange because James is there right through the book of Acts. And you have a book written by James. And in um, Jude, the book of Jude begins by saying, Jude, the brother of James. So, you say... Who is this James? And you find out to your amazement that it is not James the disciple. Another James became head of the church. And this James was a brother of Jesus. 
He was a brother of Jesus. Just go to, go to Matthew 13 and verse 55. Matthew 13 and verse 55. Matthew 13 and verse 55. When Jesus went to preach in Nazareth, look at what the people say. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Judas is the one that is Jude. He's the one who wrote the book of Jude. Now it's interesting because apparently after Jesus died, his family became big in the church. It kind of makes you think about the way how human minds operate. The man with the biggest degree or the man whose father was most influential. It makes you see that in the early church, human perspectives did not disappear. How James come to be the big shot in the church, I don't know, but he became. In fact, look at what happened while Jesus was here. In Luke 8 and verse 21, about in verse 20, it says that the disciples, his, his mother and his brethren, came and they demanded to see Jesus. And look at what Jesus says in verse 21. It says, And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, don't try to use family influence, family family." pull string with me because the people who I really regard as being mine in the truest sense are those who hear God's word and read. not because these people are my blood relatives that's what he was saying right and let's go to John 7 and read verses 3 to 7 to see why it was really necessary for him to say this John 7 I'm going to read from verse 3 Now here's what, there's, what happens. In verse 2. Now the Jews feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him. And it doesn't mean church brethren. His brethren therefore said unto him. Depart hence and go unto Judea. That thy disciples also may see thy works that thou doest. Now he says thy disciples. So they apparently were not his disciples. Right? For there is no man that doeth anything in secret. And he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. His brothers never believed in Jesus while he was here. Then Jesus said unto him, said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. It's always your time, but it's not my time yet. In other words, you and I don't think the same way. Right? The world cannot hate you, but me it hated because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. You can see him saying that you guys have a different spirit from me. You don't understand what is going on. That was the condition of Jesus' family. Well, maybe apart from his mother. They are of the world. Right. So, so it's strange that when he was here, this should have been his testimony. He didn't call any of them to be his disciples because of this attitude that they had. Later on, they, they came to believe in Jesus. We're not denying this. But to come to believe in Jesus and then to rapidly be elevated to the place where you become the general conference president. <laughs> something very strange happened in that church. The people lost their spiritual insight. I'm telling you. Yes, well you are, but go. <laughs> All right, fine. I'm going to give you one more. I, no, I'm going to give you a few more. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just take, um, uh, give Tracy her proof. I think it's, I think the, the last part of Galatians chapter one. Let's see if we can find it. So uh, we all look together. But there's a place where it says James, the Lord's brother. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, Acts one, uh, Galatians one and verse nineteen. Right. So let's just read that first. Howard. Um, Paul says, after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. He has now become one of the apostles. Right. And Acts 2 says, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. Right. 
So anything after Acts chapter 12 cannot be James the brother of John. Acts 12 and verse 2. But let's go to Acts 21 and verse 18. Acts 21, and we're going to look at verse 18. Now, this is way up in Acts 21. This is when Paul comes to Jerusalem for the last time. And look what it says in verse 18. And the following day, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Why does he mention only James? James is a big cheese. He's a big shot. He goes into James. And it happens that all the elders are present as well. But he goes up to Jerusalem and it is necessary, necessary for him to go to see the big man in the church. That is James. And this is the James who is the Lord's brother. But I want you to notice how Paul regards them. Look at Galatians 2 and let's look at verse 9. He's talking about the council in Jerusalem and what happened up there. And when he had this big contention with these false brethren coming and aware. And he says, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, who is Cephas? Peter, when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars. So Paul, when, God called, when Jesus called Paul, he went away and he forgot about Jerusalem. He had nothing to do with them there. Maybe that's what kept his faith so pure. When he comes back to Jerusalem, he's coming back into the politics, the political scene of the church. And he doesn't know what's going on. And he says, three of them seem to be big shots. He's looking around and seeing how people are relating to these people. And he said, of these who seemed to be pillars. So that's how he's describing Peter, James, and John. So it is clear that there was developing in the Christian church a hierarchical structure. And James seemed to be at the top of it. And no wonder people today look at the Bible and say, our church is organized in the apostolic way. Our organization is right. And they think that because it's in the Bible, it was perfect. Wrong. We need to go deeper than the surface and look at the principles underlying everything. We need to understand what it means to have Christ alone as our one mediator between God and man. So, I'll go to one more passage here in Galatians. Galatians 2. And we'll read verses 11 and 12. I'm going to ask somebody to read it for me if you have a strong, loud voice. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the faith, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from him. From where? James. Go on. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself now this is after the Jerusalem council yes. Peter is down at Antioch he goes to visit Paul Antioch was like Paul's headquarters right mm -hmm. he goes down to Gen Antioch and he's visiting with Paul and of course the brethren have a love feast like we had on Sabbath mm -hmm. and they gather together and they are eating and Peter is comfortable with everybody right mm -hmm. then he looks through the window and he sees some men and who are they they are his brethren from Jerusalem from J James's inner circle and they're going to come and catch Peter eating with Gentiles, which is against what? The law. The law. And Peter jump up and find himself in the next corner. <laughs> and poor Barnabas, who understands the truth, is so confused that he jumps up and goes and join Peter too. And the other Jewish brethren who are there do the same thing. And Paul is outraged. He's outraged and he says, I withstood him to his face. And Paul rebuked him to his face. Don't think that it was all hunky-dory in that early church. <laughs> the, 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 the principles of these two great philosophies were raging within the church. And you had strong people who were supporting one side of it. And thank God, the one I consider the strongest one was on the other side. Like I say, I see the same issues arising today among us. Same issues. And the same kind of tugging. But I say we have to decide 
where does the truth lie and make sure we stand up firm on the right side and, and stand up like how Paul stood up. Amen. Not like how Barnabas stood because he went up there with Paul and when Peter jumped, gone, he gone with Peter. <laughs> no, man. You have to know what you believe and stand yes. upon where you see the truth is. So, and, and I, just, I just boost Paul and I have to back down a little bit. Because go with me to Acts 21. <laughs> Pressure. I agree. I agree. And it's a warning to the rest of us. A warning to the rest of us. Um, we're going to start from about um, verse 20. Did I say 21? I'll tell you the verse in just a moment. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong chapter. Acts 21 and verse 18. Did I say Heather? You said 18. All right. I probably meant 18. Acts chapter 21 and we go to verse 18. We'll start with verse 18 and I'm going to read because I want to comment as I go. And the following day, Paul went in with us unto James. And all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous for the law. I wonder who miseducated them. Whoever brought them to the gospel didn't educate them properly. How can you be Christians and zealous for the law? He doesn't even mention that they are zealous for Christ. And these same brethren, they are informed of thee, you Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now notice what they are concerned about. They are concerned about the Jews. They don't business with the Gentiles. They say, Paul, if you are teaching the Gentiles, this is okay, but you are teaching the Jews. And that's their concern. And so these brethren who believe, they have a Paul. And so James is saying, Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a, have a vow on them. Take them, purify thyself with them, and be at charge with them, that they may shave their heads, and that all may know that these things whereof thou were uh, informed concerning thee are nothing. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. The no such thing is what? The law. the law. Only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Now, of course, it's clear enough that no, nobody here is a Jew. So nobody here has a, 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 by any means stretch has any reason to keep the law. But James was saying that the Jews had a reason to keep the law and Paul should not tell the Jews not to keep the law. I believe this was to mongrelize the Christian religion. It was to make a division and to make a double standard and to confuse people. Because they never understood the purity of salvation because they had this confusing double standard. And that's why Paul called them false brethren coming to spy out our liberty. Because that's what all the apostles should have been saying. They should have been saying, look, we once were Jews. We once, were, we once approached God through the law. Now God has provided a new and living way. Even the blood and the life of his son by which we come near to God. No longer through the system of the law. Every Christian should have accepted that and done like Paul. Cast away the bond woman. And they should have been willing to make it all nothing but dung. That they might win Christ. But no. They held on to their culture and their history. And so Paul comes and they say to Paul, Paul. We wanted to just show the brethren. Do something that you don't normally do. Just, just show the brethren that you are not against the law. And they broke down Paul. The man who knew that this was an anti-Christian way went about it. You know what they were asking him to do? They said they had a vow and they were going to shave their head. Which vow had they taken? 
It was a Nazarite vow. And the Nazarite vow was that when the time was up, you had to shave your head and then do what? Offer animal sacrifice. Paul made them, Paul made them bring him to the place where he was going to offer sacrifice and deny Jesus Christ in order to make peace. In order to make peace. So, 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 do, huh? What wrong to offer an animal sacrifice? It wasn't for their faith. It wasn't for their faith. It was to show them that he was a good Jew. And that was not true because Paul was not a good Jew because he said he cast it all out as dung. He was doing it. He was bending to please people who did not have enough sense as he had. And that is not, that is not something that God required of him. I am persuaded God didn't require that. So, you know what happened. He went and he went in the sanctuary and they caught him and they nearly killed him in there. Right? They beat him. All this little, little scheme never produced one good thing. It killed Paul. Yeah, they caught him in there and they took him away and he eventually died. He was eventually beheaded. It wasn't they, the people who told him to do it. When he went into this temple, some other Jews from somewhere else came and saw him. And they said, this is the man who is teaching people to forsake the law. And they grabbed him and they beat him, nearly killed him. The Romans had to come and save him. And then the Romans made him a prisoner. Eventually he ended up in Rome where he was beheaded two years later. He never was free anymore. Now, I just want to point out two things and then I'm going to stop. One is that when you read the book of Acts, you find a remarkable surge of miracles from the beginning, from chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit fell. Read the book of Acts carefully and you'll find that about after chapter 8, chapter 15, you don't hear much about miracles anymore, except with the Apostle Paul. The, the, the book of Acts begins to follow Paul and you see even kerchiefs from his body. People are being healed, but you don't hear much about any miracles in the rest of the church. It just seems to dry up. Now Paul says that if you are justified by the law, what? Christ will profit you nothing. I always wondered why is it that the Holy Spirit died out of the church? Was it God's will that it should be so? I always wonder why it is that today we pray for the Holy Spirit and we do all of this and we can't see one drop. Hardly. And then I'm seeing more clearly that the issue is this. The man who comes to God with a pure dependence on Jesus Christ alone, a pure dependence, can have all that is in Christ. But Paul says, if your faith is muted by any dependence on what? On the law. You will have nothing. Christ will profit you nothing. And I'm suggesting to you that this is why 1888, when the Holy Spirit, when, when the message of righteousness by faith, righteousness in Christ, came to the Adventist church. One of the most outstanding pioneers said, the loud cry is what? Those who know the statement. The loud, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. Because when somebody begins to understand that Jesus Christ is everything, then you are beginning to come to the place There's no way in earth that I can resist that. Hey. He wants to start his preaching career. <laughs> so, I believe that I believe that the miracles dried up because legalism took over the church. Paul says the mystery of iniquity is already working. But the one who is preventing it, the one who, not, who let it, will let until he be taken out of the way. Who is the one who was preventing it and then was removed? Paul? James? Jesus Christ. Think about it. How did they move Jesus out of the, the church? They replaced him with what? They replaced him with law. That's what you see happening in that church. You, have, you see the conflict between the pure religion of faith in Christ and the religion of the Moses party. 
the James party. You see that, that them overwhelming the church. They take over Jerusalem. They're spreading out into Judea and Antioch. What do you think happened after Paul died? Paul says, I know that after my departing, what? Grievous wolves shall come in, not sparing the flock. He said it because he was like almost a lone star standing up against the rising tide of apostasy. And when he died, it was overwhelmed. You wonder why darkness came into that church so rapidly. You wonder why a church like the Roman Catholic Church could take over the apostolic church. The most legalistic church in existence is the Church of Rome. Their whole service, they're full of feast days, reverence for saints, indulgences, penance, works, works, works. It was all an outgrowth from that early focus, that early embracing of that system of works. And, they, and, 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 and organizationally, yes, it's the same organization. Yes. So, it's frightening when you look at it, isn't it? But, but if you look at all the evidence that I've presented this morning, it's very difficult for you to say it's not true. Very difficult. Because if we are honest people and we did look at the, the evidence, it seems more than clear that this is a history of what really happened. It is for us to look at it and take a lesson from it. There is no safety anywhere but in Jesus Christ. God help us to learn. And it is not somebody's concept of Christ. It is a living reality of Jesus Christ dwelling in me. When I have that, look here. Lenny is not my gauge of right and wrong. No! Brother Ken is not my gauge. Thank God we see eye to eye. But look here. If you've gone east and Christ is with me at pointing west... Goodbye, Brother Ken. Jesus is the reason. And that's why the Bible says there's one way to have unity, isn't it? We must endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. The one Spirit living in us binds us together and teaches us because we are listening to that Spirit. When you start listening to men, institutions, organizations, you are in danger. So God help us that we might be true to this great essential focus. Well, thank you all for your attentive listening. I hope you have been blessed. I'm going to ask you to let us bow our heads and give thanks.